Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts, and this is my fourth edition of this massive, huge European book haul uh, series that I've been doing. So I, if you're still watching this, I have already done three videos today. <laughs> this day will not ever end. I've already done LA and Italy. I've already done Paris. I've already done Edinburgh, Manchester, and Bath. So today is London. We finally arrived. We check into our hotel and we immediately hit, hit the streets and start walking around. This is the first time we've ever stayed in Holborn. We usually stay in Shoreditch. First time we stayed in Marylebone. So I, I tried to have us stay in different parts of London each time so that we can kind of experience something of a different neighborhood. This this may be our neighborhood, y'all. <laughs> uh, we were so close to so many bookstores, including the strip of Charing Cross Road where 84 Charing Cross Road was written about. Yes, yes. Uh, if you know me, if you watch my channel, you know 84 Charing Cross Road is my favorite book and I lead a read along uh, every first day of the year, January 1st of every single year. So delightful to be that close and spending that much time in the neighborhood. And if you also know the area, you know that Foils is kind of diagonal across the street. So within six minutes, we walked from our hotel to Foils. We're in Foils and it's, it's a shop that both myself and my husband just adore. And I think it's because their selection, the way they curate, um, how they lay everything out is so thoughtful, but it's also so vast and complete. Like they have everything. So let me show you what we got. The first one was a recommendation from Mel at Mel's Bookland Adventure. She also is on Instagram as Melanie Martin. So I'll put a link to, to both ways to follow her below. She's brilliant, has just the best, uh, I go to her for historical fiction and mysteries because uh, she just has exceptional, exceptional taste. I mean, she has exceptional taste in everything, but those are explicitly like if she likes it, I'm going to like it. So she speaks about this author endlessly and she's right. This person deserves, this woman deserves so much attention. It's S.G. McLean. I cannot find her books in the United States. So I... I, I slowed down. I probably should have gotten more, but I only got this one. This is the first of a different series. This is the Seeker series, and this is number one. This one, the 2015 CWA Endeavor Historical Dagger Award. This is set in London in 1654. Uh, I'm a huge fan of London 1666, uh, when we had you had the plague and the great fire happened and how that changed the city. And, and I'm just endlessly fascinated by that. So I can very easily see this being a tee up to all of those crazy situations happening in the city of London. Cannot wait. Uh, I find that S.G. McLean writes incredibly uh, atmospheric, thoughtful, smart uh, mystery, historical mystery. So this is going to be great, I can tell already. Then I was looking forward to finding more Elizabeth Bowen books, and I found this gorgeous edition, The House in Paris. I just think it's so, so pretty. This has a foreword by A.S. Byatt, who wrote a number of books, The Emperor's Children and Possession. <laughs> I knew it would come to me. Like Anita Bruckner, Elizabeth Bowen is a stylist. She writes very thoughtful, dense, uh, a lot of illusions, a lot of imagery, psychologically interesting, just, just really stylized writing and that I, I love. Uh, this though, I'm a little worried, but I'm, I'm going to try it only because we have a child character and I do, you know, child narrators, I don't always enjoy but I, I have at least more faith in her as, as kind of owning the narrative here. It says, when 11 year old Henrietta arrives at the Fisher's residence in Paris, little does she know what fascinating secrets the house itself contains. 
Henrietta finds that her visit coincides with that of Leopold, an intense child who's come to Paris to be introduced to the mother he has never known. In the course of a single day, the mystery surrounding Leopold, his parents, Henrietta's agitated hostess, and the dying matriarch in the bed upstairs come to light slowly and tantalizingly. That sounds good, right? Next up, this has been one that I have had in my want list at for online from Blackwell's for at least a year and a half. And so when I saw it, I was like, that's it, I'm grabbing it. This is Search Sweet Country by Kojo Langing. And this is set in, in Ghana in the 1970s. Now, I was raised in Mozambique, Africa in the nine, late 1970s. So I, already there's a kinship and, a, and an interest there. It says, in the streets, marketplaces, and crowded houses of the sprawling city, an unforgettable cast of characters live, love, and try to get by. An idealistic professor, a beautiful young witch, a wide-eyed student, a corrupt politician, a healer, and a man intent on founding his own village. Through their stories and those living, breathing the city itself, Kojo Lang's dazzling novel, creates a portrait of a place caught between colonialism and freedom, eternity and the present. Sounds absolutely magnificent. Next, uh, here's also an, uh, an author I was looking for and have, and have really a lot of challenges finding her work here in the United States. And this is Isabel Colgate. I've seen her, her name written in, in different ways. I've seen it I-S-O-B-E-L. Here is I-S-A-B-E-L. But this is The Shooting Party. And it says, stylish and funny, vivid and brilliant as a painting on glass. Uh, the blurb goes on to say, it is autumn 1913 and a brilliant array of guests has gathered at Sir Randolph Nettleby's Oxfordshire estate for a shooting party. Opulent, adulterous, moving assuredly through the rituals of eating and slaughter, they represent a dazzlingly opaque and wonderful decorative finale of an era, that of the privileged in Edwardian England. But as war approaches, the group find their social peace is shattered and change and violence invade their lives. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, the next one really caught my eye, first because the cover is so compelling, and secondly because of who did the foreword. And if you know me, you know that I really don't read introductions or forwards until after I read, read the book, but I'll read this one after. This is We Want Everything by Nani Balestrini, and the introduction is by Rachel Kushner. Rachel Kushner wrote one of my absolute favorite books called The Flamethrowers, and, which is a sprawling book about... Uh, a young woman, it's kind of like an adventure story, and she grows up in Reno, Nevada, and then ends up in in Italy with with anarchists. And there's uh, there's a stint in New York with art dealers and the art world. Uh, there's motorcycles in the desert. It's set in the '70s. It's just it's phenomenal in my opinion, and so. This book, I can see why she was drawn to writing the introduction because it's about Italy and about those same anarchists, the same kind of setting that she placed our character in, in the frame first. The inside flap says, the explosive novel of Italy's revolutionary 1969. Temperatures were rising across the factories of the North. Soon discontent would erupt in what became known as Italy's hot autumn. A young worker from the impoverished South arrives at Fiat's Mia Fiori factory in Turin, where his darker complexion begins to fade from the 14 hour workdays and in sweltering industrial heat. His bosses try to withhold his wages. Our cynical, dry witted narrator will not bend to their will. I want everything, everything that's owed to me, he tells them. Nothing more, nothing less, because you don't mess with me. Around him, students are holding secret meetings and union workers are bringing work on the assembly lines to a halt. And before long, bar barricades line the roads, tear gas wafts into private homes, and the slogan, we want everything, is ringing through the streets. 
Wrought in spare and measured prose, Balstrini's novel depicts an explosive uprising. It's the incendiary fictional account of events that led to the decade of revolt. Sounds so good, right? And the last thing I bought from Foils is this new book. It's just released by Faber Editions, and this is Gwendolyn Brooks' first, no first and maybe only novel, she's known as a poet, Maud Martha. It just sounds phenomenal. Uh, Maud Martha Brown is a little girl growing up on the south side of 1940s Chicago. Amidst the crumbling tavern and overgrown yard, she dreams of New York, romance, her future. She admires dandelions, learns to drink coffee, falls in love, decorates her kitchenette, visits the jungly hovel, hears speakers on campus, guts a chicken, buys hats, gives birth. But her lighter skinned husband has dreams too, of the foxy cat club, other women, war, and the scraps of baffled hate, a certain word from a saleswoman that visits into the cinema, the cruelty of a department store, Santa Claus, are always there. And yes, it says this is the only novel from her. Uh, so really excited to get to that. Okay, so then I went to Piccadilly and to Hatchards. And I go to Hatchards for their signed editions. They usually have a, a good number of signed editions that the other uh, stores don't carry. And just to kind of take a look around. Hatchards, I have to admit, is not my most favorite. I find it to be a little snooty, um, but that's just me. <laughs> but look what I found at Hatchards. Uh, so they have released, I'm not sure if you can see this, this is Don't Tell Alfred by Nancy Mitford, a special release copy. And I, of course, had to get it. This is number, is that the, like 12? Yeah, 1210 out of 2000 run limited edition. Really pretty. Very nice end papers. Let me show you those. And the plaque signifying the number. Uh, so this was specifically for Hatchard's library and happy to get that. And yes, they've been a bookstore since 1797, as they say, but okay. <laughs> Got this. So uh, if you don't know Nancy Mitford, she, I, uh, the Mitfords, I have a fascination with, endless fascination. This book I have yet to read, but it's one I'm, I'm I think maybe most looking forward to other than Nancy Mitford's uh, biographies of famous French uh, people. I'm gonna read a little bit of the back and so you can get a sense of, of what it's about. A uh, posting to Paris should be every diplomat's dream. For this particular diplomat's unfortunate wife, it is a posting of potential pitfalls. Her mother, the bolter, is there with her new unsuitable husband. Her idle son is there when he shouldn't be. And the previous lady ambassador refuses to move out of the embassy. Can things get any worse? In Nancy Mitford's wicked hands, obviously, yes. Uh, to quote Evelyn Waugh from his piece on the book in the London Magazine, there is an excellently rendered farcical conclusion which should not be revealed to the reader. Okay. So really looking forward to reading that one. Then I saw this and it caught my eye. I walked by, past it maybe two or three times. Rebel Writers, Accidental Feminists by Celia Brayfield. Let me show you that great cover. <laughs> On the back it says, in London in 1958, a play by a 19-year-old redefined women's writing in Britain. It also began a movement that would change women's lives forever. The play was A Taste of Honey, and the author, Sheila Delaney, was the first in a succession of young women who wrote about their lives with an honesty that dazzled the world. They rebelled against sexism, inequality, and prejudice, and in doing so challenged the existing definitions of what writing and writers should be. Bypassing the London cultural elite, the work reached audiences of millions around the world paved the way for profound social changes and laid the foundation for second wave feminism. So that sounds fun. That sounds fun. Sounds like a good nonfiction November read to tee up. Then there were these really interesting things that I just kind of caught my eye uh, that I thought, okay, well, I'll try them. 
The first is The Day of the Owl by Leonardo Schiaschia. I'm just going to read a few sentences from the back to give you a taste. In a small town in Sicily, a man in a dark suit is running for the bus. Two shots ring out just as he jumps onto the running board. He dies in front of a vehicle full of witnesses, all of whom have slipped out the back door by the time the police arrive. Yeah, <laughs> it's a tiny little slim uh, palate cleanser of a novel. Really excited. This is, let's see if it's translated. Translated from the Italian by Archibald Colquin and Arthur Oliver and published by Granta. This next one sounds amazing and I have never heard of this and probably wouldn't have unless I saw it there. This is Three by Anne Quinn. And it says, Three opens with the disappearance at sea, possible suicide of a young woman identified only as S. Her bickering middle-aged hosts pour over her diary, audio recordings and movies, a charged record of voyeurism and surveillance. As their obsession with S comes to dominate their marriage, what emerges is an absorbing portrait of their triangular relationship and of the emotional and sexual undercurrents of 1950s British middle-class life. Sounds good, right? Then this is a book that I was very interested in getting. Uh, and I, I, the whole concept it still stuns me. It's a narrative nonfiction true story called The Premonitions Bureau by Sam Knight. And let me read you a little bit because it just sounds so engaging. What if you had a vision that something very particular and very terrible was gonna happen? A train crash, a department store fire, an assassination. What if you could share your vision and prevent a disaster? In 1966, John Barker, a psychiatrist working in an outdated British mental hospital, established the Premonitions Bureau to investigate this very idea. He would find a network of hundreds of correspondents from bank clerks to ballet teachers. Among them were two highly gifted precipients. Together, the pair predicted calamities and international incidents with uncanny accuracy. By then, they gave Barker their most disturbing warning that he was about to die. The Premonitions Bureau is an enthralling true story of madness and wonder, science and the supernatural, a journey to the most powerful reaches of the human mind. Sounds fantastic. Okay, so those were those bookstores. And then Elizabeth came to town from Norway and she and I met up. She was able to spend a little bit of her vacation in London and we met up on her last day and we went book shopping. We started in Scoob. Now, I love Scoob. I, I think Scoob is great. I take so much time there. They're so kind. They're so thoughtful, generous. Uh, I just, I dig that bookstore very, very much. So, uh, I, but I also, it takes me a long time in, in a bookstore in the UK because I just, I, I'm finding so many new books, so many new authors. I, I can't just scan and, and sweep the shelves like I can do in the United States because I just, I've just, I know what I'm expecting to find and what I primarily will see. And so bless her heart, Elizabeth was incredibly patient with me. And we went through the entire store and I found some gems. First up, a lovely Virago modern classic, M.J. Farrell, also known as Molly Keene, Devoted Ladies. Now, I have seen this book for many years and wanted it, but it really was afraid to order it from a used bookstore uh, because when you order online, you never know, is it gonna be written in? Is it, is it, is it gonna be worse shape than, it, than they say and claim? And I just don't like to waste my money. So to be able to find this there and it hasn't even been cracked, completely brand new, pristine practically. Let me read you the back of this one. It is 1933. Jessica and Jane have been living together for six months. They're devoted friends. Or are they? Jessica, with her heavy, dark charm, has a vicious way with words and a temperament that inclines toward violence. She loves her friend with the cruelty of total possessiveness. Jane, with her geometric lines and blonde hair, is perfect, but for the thread of a scar by her mouth. 
She is rich and silly and drinks rather too many brandies and sodas. Their friend Sylvester regrets that Jane should be loved and bullied and perhaps even murdered by that frightful Jessica, but decides it's none of his business. However, when the Irish gentleman George Playfair meets Jane, he decides it's very much his business. He entices her to Ireland where the battle begins and it will be a fight to the death, but who will win? Just sounds delightful. I also found this Elizabeth Taylor that's been on my radar forever. This is at Mrs. Lippincott's. Gorgeous cover there. Mrs. Lippincott's house with its heavy furniture and yellowing photographs stands for all the certainties that have vanished with the advent of war. And temporarily, it is home for Julia, regarded as the most unsatisfactory officer's wife, who has joined her husband Roddy at the behest of the RAF with her young son and Roddy's cousin, Eleanor. The novel depicts all the hypocrisies and evasions inherent in marriage as a household undergoes the chance encounters and social flux of the war years. Sounds fantastic. And it's Elizabeth Taylor is one of those authors that I have read and liked very much. So I'm looking forward to reading more. And then I found another Isabel Colgate. Again, in this edition, it's Isabel with an A instead of an O, uh, but this one is called Winter Journey. So I think I've made mention that I've been looking for Isabel Colgate. I've been looking for Sipa Belford. Uh, so some of these authors that I just, I've heard of, but I just cannot find them in the US. And so I struck riches here. For Edith, a visit to her brother is also a journey into the past. In the dead of winter, she vis visits the family home in the Mendips to stay with Alfred, once a celebrated photographer and fashion idol, now a solitary, careless bachelor. Edith herself has two broken marriages and a shattered career as an MP behind her. So between them, they must and do find a way of putting the past behind them and looking to the future with hope optimism, and mutual affection. Sounds good. But the highlight, the thing that made me gasp out loud is a collection. Oh, I don't even know if I can hold these up. An almost pristine collection of E.M. Forster's novels. I'm so excited. I am so excited. Okay, I'm going to put these down. So, uh, a Room with a View is what made me fall in love with Florence as a teenager. I saw the movie before I read the book. The book is absolutely charming, witty, so romantic, so funny, dripping with atmosphere, uh, absolutely phenomenal. Love it. Howard's End, great comedy of manners about a home uh, that was left uh, to uh, an unknown. So the family thought they were going to get this home and it's actually left to someone else. And that woman uh, and is anathema to them and it creates all sorts of drama. Completely delightful as well. Then a book that I'm going to read for next month as part of my Pride Reads, uh, Maurice. I have meant to read this book for so many years. This is one of the uh, great gay novels uh, that, uh, that exists, and I have yet, I'm ashamed to say I have yet to read it, so I'm finally going to rectify that. I have never read Where Angels Fear to Tread, but it sounds absolutely remarkable. It sets place in Monteriano, Italy, uh, where Lilia Harrington, a young English widow, has gone on holiday. That's, you don't need to tell me anymore. <laughs> Ian Forster, Italy, young widow, done. Uh, the Longest Journey, which I haven't heard anything about, uh, is perhaps the most brilliant, most dramatic, and most passionate of his works, and it's among his favorite of his work. The novel revolves around Ricky Elliott, a congenitally lame young man with a tragic past. Raised in a stifling English suburb, Ricky is sent to Cambridge to achieve greatness and there encounters the temptations of an impractical life, one of philosoph philosophical questions, wild hopes, and imaginative flights. 
His marriage to the conventional and pragmatic Agnes Pembroke, whom he mistakenly believes is his great passion, and his subsequent move to Sawston to live and teach provide the background for this, the story of Ricky's true enlightenment. Interesting, but the, the one that I'm most excited to read, absolutely most excited to read, A Passage to India. Now, I stayed away from this for so long because I, I was worried that it was going to be uh, written with this uh, glory to colonial, the old colonial days. But I've actually heard that it's a good takedown of colonialism, which if you follow my channel, you know that I absolutely uh, wait for with bated breath. So I am very much, very much looking forward to reading this. And this is on the list to be read soon. So that is London part one. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this so far. I would love to know based on what I've shown you, have you read any of those? Are you interested in reading any of these? And uh, do you have any recommendations based on this genre, all of this melange that I've kind of showed you today? Thank you so much for watching. And as always, I'll look forward to talking to you in the next video. Thank you so much. Bye.